I'm very pleased to introduce you two gentlemen today. First on my far left, Professor Gerard Goggin is a Professor of Media and Communications at the University of Sydney. He has an international reputation for social justice and disability activism. His research focuses on social, cultural and political aspects of digital technologies and how they affect disability and accessibility. He's published 20 books and over 170 journal articles and book chapters and is a board member of the Disability Studies and Research Institute. And his Wikipedia page is way out of date. <laughs> I promise you, Jared, it will be improved by the end of this conference. He's recently returned from Singapore, is back at University of Sydney and it has a whole ho anyway, it needs updating. Graham Pierce probably needs no introduction, but I will anyway. He is a Wikipedia rock star. <laughs> Graham made his first edit on the 17th of February, 2005. He corrected the spelling of Kananara. It has two N's, not three. Since then, he has made more than 258,000 edits across more than 147,000 pages, has himself created more than 14,500 pages, and importantly, he has thanked more than 2,700 people, wiki style. He's a founding member of Wikiblind User Group and his own user page is full of barn stars and thank yous from fellow editors, which as we know, says a lot. So I'd like to now hand you over to Graham and Jared. Uh, so just thanks again to, to Bunty and to Francis and, and uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you, Graham. And so I suppose I just wanted to, to invite you to tell us a bit more about yourself. You're obviously well known to, to some and many here, but could you tell us a bit about yourself and how you came to, to Wikipedia? Um, I'm Graham Pierce, he's known Graham 87. I'm totally blind. I was born, I became blind because I was born 15 weeks premature. Um, it's called Resonopathy of Prematurity. You can, you can Wikipedia it. Um, <laughs> um, I've always been you know, interested in correcting people's mistakes and you know, if I'd get work bailed out for me, I'd, I'd, want, I'd find all the mistakes and want them to be corrected. Um, so if Wikipedia was kind of a natural fit for me when I'd finally discovered what it was. Um, I first found Wikipedia through a, a copy or mirror called thefreedictionary.com, but it took me a few months to realise what Wikipedia actually was and that I could edit it. And once I started editing it, I was, I was hooked forever, basically. <laughs> that's, that's great. And so can you tell us a bit about also uh, maybe, you know, the technology you use and the, or the technology you used initially and also the technology you're using now when you, you know, get about and edit Wikipedia? You mean the technology I used when I started on Wikipedia or in general? Well, yeah, I, I would be quite interesting. I have to out myself because actually one of the areas I'm really interested in is internet histories. And actually, I started an academic journal called Internet History. So I'm kind of interested also in how, how things progress. So I, I would be interested to hear you talk about early days in terms of using the technology and then what you do now. Um, I guess we don't have all day, but um, <laughs> I first started on the internet in the late 1990s at a computer club at what was then the, the Association for the Blind. Um, I didn't get home internet access till the year 2000, and by then we were using Windows 98 and Internet Explorer 5. Um, and I've always used a screen reader called JAWS, which makes the computer talk to me. Um, and now I use JAWS with, with Chrome, which you probably some of you would be, would be familiar with. So what Bunty might do now, and Josh might do, is just uh, play a clip from, I think, a piece you did with SBS, Graham. Yes. Because I'm blind, I use a thing called a screen reader that makes the computer talk to me. I've been using this sort of 
technology since I was about four years old. I just practiced and so I could listen to it at a very high speed. So somebody's obviously had suffered, they shouldn't have, to the article. Every day I probably spend about four to eight hours in Wikipedia, sometimes more. So I think we just, the idea of that was to really, so that Graham, so you didn't have to uh, get your kit gear sort of set up to actually replicate the kind of sounds and what you do with the screen reader in your computer as well. Yeah. But tell us a little bit about that setup that you have as well, because you've, you've now got a quite small computing device, right, that you work with. Yeah, it's, um, it's a thing called a NUC, or next unit of computing Next unit of computing made by Intel. Um, they're sort of a bit like MacBook Air. Um, they're very small. Um, they're just this basically this box with a computer in it, and you connect a monitor. Or I don't need a monitor, but you can connect one, or a keyboard, or headphones, or whatever you need. Great, yeah, thank you. And unfortunately, I think it doesn't power, it has to have the one you've got needs power. So we've got, you know, yeah. in this venue, it's a bit trickier. But so can you tell us a little about, about you know, how you uh, started to approach um, Wikipedia? I mean, I think it was covered a bit even in the clip, but just to tell us a bit about, you know, how you really started to um, start to edit in Wikipedia and then sort of progress to become an administrator. And the kind of things that took your interest, I suppose, it'd be really interesting to just hear a bit about, you know, what, what really drew you to it. Yeah. Um, the first things I started to edit were um, actually a list of interesting or unusual place names, as Spunty was alluding to in the intro, where I was fixing a spelling of the town of Kananara. Um, and then I edited like random things I studied at school or or just really completely random things that took my interest. Oh, one of my first edits was about one of the hottest towns in Australia called Marble Bar um, <laughs> because I'm obsessed with, one thing I'm, I'm obsessed with is the weather and meteorology and I added in the exact the exact dates of the record run of high temperatures there, and cited a reference as well, which is very unusual for 2005. Um, <laughs> um, and I really hit my stride when I found what's now called the typo team, where people go around correcting typos. And <laughs> I just found that like, really interesting, just reading random articles um, I corrected the typo, but people would spell Portuguese without the U. And I found all sorts of interesting articles about like a famous female racing driver, um, all sorts of random things about and had to do with Portugal and Portuguese. And I just got hooked in from there, really. That's great. And so, and so what happened then? And was it partly that, um, as well as just having that opportunity to work with things that you were curious about or found interesting, that were you, was there something about um, sort of seeing that resource and feeling that it, it was incorrect or there were problems with it that you were keen to then work on and try and then eventually become a custodian of, right? Is that part of what sort of animated you and drew you to it? Yeah, I think it just happened organically. Like, yeah, I would add on Wikipedia, a lot of regular users have a thing called a watch list, a list of articles they keep an eye on, or an ear on in my case. And, um, and mind, I just had any article I was interested in, really, and it just built up and built up until it was very substantial. And, and yeah, and so, and what was the shift like when you? then moved to being an administrator. Um, How did you find that kind of shift in going to that? 
it wasn't a major shift for me. The, the biggest problem was all these new buttons that were kind of in the way, like a rollback button. But that's a problem for sighted people too. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't... Actually, when I became an admin, that's when I started getting really into Wikipedia archaeology or wiki archaeology. Right. Yeah, and can, can you tell us a little bit more about wiki archaeology? What, I mean, what for the, for the non-initiated, what, you know, what is that and you know, what, why is it important? Um, well, on Wikipedia, every edit should ideally be saved. Um, in what's called a written history. And Wikipedia archaeology is like looking back through the history and finding um, finding things about like when the article was made or sometimes I do a history emerge which is basically fixes attribution errors. So you can see who actually wrote the article properly. Um, and occasionally there's times where history was missing completely because it had been deleted years ago. Um, one of the most notable gaps is actually the article about the Italian mafia, <laughs> of all things. I see. So, I mean, this kind of works really crucial to the sort of integrity, right, of Wikipedia in yeah. doing, doing this kind of restoring and going back through to make sure this is complete record. Yeah. Is that the kind of stakes in it, in a way? Yeah. Yeah. And what, I mean, one of the things that you've got, that got some sort of more public attention for is um, trying to stop and intercept vandals. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, that kind of, the ways in which that's come onto your radar and some of the things you've done around that? Um, a lot of the articles on my watch list are not subjects I'm interested in. They're just subjects where I've found vandalism that's lasted for more than a couple of days. Um, and sometimes I just find it by reading. Like, I remember one day I was reading this article about, um, I think it was the term neurosis. Um, and it said, this, this term was coined by Hannah Johnson in the 18th century. And I was thinking, that would be really unusual to have a woman doctor in the 18th century coining a term like that. That sounds a bit, um, that sounds a bit sus. So I looked in the article history and, um, yeah, it had been vandalised probably a month or more before. <laughs> And I went to fix it, and it's been my watch list ever since. Right. And what, I mean, do you have, what, what's your sort of theories, I suppose, or ideas about, you know, why does the vandalism occur? I mean, what, what's, what, you know, attracts people to kind of doing the kind of thing? Is it just mischief and, um, you know, being able to play around and, and trick people? Or what do you think sort of lies behind that? Um... Most of the short-term vandalism is probably just bored school kids, honestly. Yeah. Got nothing better to do. Um, the longer-term stuff, like the boy band vandal you heard about earlier, yeah. that I, I don't understand, but people, well, obviously lots of people who do it. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's part of a sort of broader, whether it's a, um, like a pastiche or satirical or other ways that people... Um, maybe take things and remix them too. Yeah. So maybe it's part of a continuum or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I wanted to just ask you, I wanted to just sort of shift direction slightly and just to ask you about um, maybe from your experience and the work you've done as well around questions of accessibility. Because obviously with, I suppose, with the web uh, and with things like projects like Wikipedia, I mean, one of the issues, and I imagine one of the ones that's animated this conference as well is about the accessibility and inclusiveness of it. So for, say, for people with disabilities and, and a range of other people, um, I mean, how accessible has Wikipedia been? Um, I think it's, it's reasonably accessible because, um, because there's a standardised layout. Um, but there, are, there is always room for improvement. Um, 
the sign up, you need to fill in a capture and the only way to fill it in is by looking at the picture. There's no audio alternative. And looking at diffs, I've found a way around that, but it's a bit interesting sometimes. Yeah, so, to, I mean, can you tell us, I mean, I suppose because one of the, the advantages that uh, Wikipedia's got is being, you know, associated with, with web and internet where standards have been worked on. Um, can you tell us a little bit, I mean, more about, you know, some of those challenges and the ways in which you've, you know, you've either been able to shift the needle or the community has dealt with those? Um, a lot of my most famous or infamous work of that was in 2006 when, um, for example, Wikipedia had come up with a new main page design, which it still uses for its home page. And um, the problem was the initial design didn't have any headings in it. And blind people rely on headings to navigate a page. And I complained about that, and they put the headings back for me. So it was something that's fairly easy for people to take some sort of corrective action on. Yeah. In that case, yeah. And what, I mean, in, in the next, I don't know, five to ten years, what kind of challenges do you see or that would need to be tackled in terms of accessibility? Um, I think the most important is a much more accessible capture. Um, I don't know if this is still true, but I remember reading the capture is also only in English, and not, in, not in any other language. And that's problematic as well. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting thing with the capture because I think people have been trying to work to get some, some change in action on it for quite a while, but there seems something around and ironically around identification, right, just verifying people, that yeah. that's, that's a huge blockage, whereas increasingly now, whether it's Wikipedia or across different technologies, that's, that's really become so critical, I suppose, partly because of the hackability of systems, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, another kind of question that, that I was interested in that I think might have wider resonance as well is about within, say, Wikipedia itself, in terms of the actual content and material, um, is there a kind of movement about, as there has been, I think we'll hear in the next session, around, say, um, question, and we heard earlier today, around, you know, the sort of diversity and the range of representation and inclusion. Is there a movement around disability representation in Wikipedia entries? And, and what's the state of play in that? I mean, I've... I work on other areas of media where people are pretty annoyed that, uh, you know, were annoyed that there hadn't been like a, a more diverse representation of people with disabilities on television or different platforms. Where does, what's the state of play as you see it with Wikipedia? Right? Um, I'm not honestly the best person to answer that question. Um, I think there have been small scale efforts, um, but the problem is with a lot of disability content, um, there, there aren't many references. Um, the, the times I've tried to find references, it's, it's not been very easy at all, and it's honestly not worth the effort for me. A fundamental threshold, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I feel like we probably in university's got a bit of a role to play there in terms of producing uh, some material, I suppose, and references as well. I mean, my sense on that count is that there is more material coming through, but I'm intrigued. And, and what about, I mean, another um, thing I was just wondering about in terms, is there a sort of participation gap around um, sort of people with disabilities participating in Wikipedia? So I had, I mean, got colleagues who've worked on, uh, they call it, say, the pipeline to participation in digital technology and digital culture, the idea to say, well, look, you know, is it a, you know, in your case, obviously, it's a very rewrite, edit culture, right? You're yeah. very engaged and the community here, many represented here, are very actively engaged, right, embodying yeah. that. But what's that pipeline look like for people? And is the, um, is that something that, that needs attention? Is there a sort of disability participation gap in Wikipedia or in other digital cultures? 
I think there is, but um, I'm not the best place to uh, how to deal with it on an abstract level, honestly. I just prefer to go in and edit. <laughs> yeah. No, fair, fair enough indeed. Well, look, at this stage, maybe we should just open it up to questions. Uh, if anyone has questions and comments. Uh, oh, there's one minor thing Sorry. I want to say. Yeah, Sorry. please, forgive me. Yeah, go ahead, Grant. Um, Bunty had said I created 14,500 pages. Um, that's, that's not quite... It is accurate technically, but a lot of those, a lot of those creations were me fiddling, like fixing attribution errors in page histories and fixing authorship. Um, I've probably only created about 200 in total, like actual articles or expanded them. So I'm not, I'm not one of those super, super creators. <laughs> super creator. Well, it's kind of interesting in a way because I suppose with editing, there's long been that sense, even pre-digital, that you know the role of the editor is in some ways to be a bit invisible, or well, the work that gets done uh, is incredibly important, whether it's in the infrastructure, in the custodian, in curating, but it, in a sense, it's, it doesn't get some of the glory of the creator. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's why Bunty was suggesting 14,000. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, look, let's go, um, let's go and hear some questions. Yeah, please go ahead and then I've got uh, some more. I, I just was wondering, uh, when you've got a question about articles about people with disabilities, uh, you didn't mention the Paralympic project that you were quite involved with. I just wanted to think maybe you'd like to say a few words on that. Yeah. Um, Sorry, can I just, for the people on Zoom, we're, Kerry has asked about... Do you want me to revoice that? So the question's about the Paralympic project and someone drawing, our, drawing Graham's, or reminding Graham about the Paralympic uh, project on Wikipedia. Yeah. Um, I was heavily active in that for, for about a year. Um, I, I actually became really interested in it. Um, I, I was on the edges for a while, but I became really interested when I found out that there was an order of, there was a medal with the Order of Australia missing in one of the entries. And I'm like, hmm, let's, let's find if there's any more. And that, that actually got me hooked in, of all, of all things. Um, <laughs> um, I helped clean up. I helped clean up articles written written by one of the other Paralympic editors and created a few of my own, but there was so much to do and such a high volume of work that I I discovered back my involvement after a while. Thanks, thanks, Graham. Thanks very much for the question. I think that's really interesting. Please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I loved hearing about the Taiko Club. Sounds like something a club I would like to join. But I was just really curious uh, to know what a typo sounds like to you. Because hearing the screen reader, I was kind of wondering, is it just that a typo gets rendered as separate letters rather than a word? Is it an approximation? What do you hear when you hear a typo? Um, it tries to make an approximation of the word. Um, there are some typos where I can't tell that they're typos. Um, actually, I got in a lot of trouble when I started editing because I didn't really know the difference between like how to spell wear and tear properly. Because my screen reader said wear and tear. <laughs> um, some typos sound... <laughs> some typos are very obvious. Um, like... It's, if you miss out the second I in initiative, a screen reader will say initiative. Um, if you miss out the U in Portuguese, you'll hear Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was typos like that that I, that I usually worked on. Yeah, I did wonder if there was something that made them stand out more for you or that sort of attracted you. Um, so that just kept... Sorry, could I ask a second question? Please, actually, do you mind introducing yourself oh, as well? I might sorry, just get... No, I course. should have just suggested yeah. to people. My name you. is Fiona Romeo, That's and right. I work on culture and heritage at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, and one of the things I'm obsessed with in that role is kind of images and sort of increasing sort of visual representation on our projects. But 
I think it's my understanding that that's one area where Wikipedia actually isn't great from an accessibility point of view. As a primarily text-based project with like predictable structuring, that's good. But actually, I think fewer than 5% of the images, even on English Wikipedia, have good alt text. Uh, so I'm wondering if that's something um, that sort of disrupts your use and enjoyment of the projects and if you have thoughts about what we could do. Honestly, like, alt text is the sort of thing that I don't know when I'm, I don't know what I'm missing out on. Um, so, like, uh, like, it's hard for me to give feedback on alt text because I can't see the image myself. Um, The awkward thing is that, like, the images have captions and often they're, they're sufficient as alt text, but you don't really know, as a blind person, you don't really know if that's the case or not. Um, and the other unique thing about Wikipedia is that most images have links attached to them. They link to the, to the file page or or to the media viewer page. Um, it's a hard problem, and I don't really know what the best solution is there. Oh, hi, it's uh, Tom Graham. Um, I'm a, I live in Western Australia, as Graham does, and I rely quite a lot on Graham's administrative capacity to be able to do things, to fix up things where in the past I used to ask, a more active admin community in the part of Australia that I'm in, but it's reduced. So I'm wondering, of the sorts of challenges that I've asked you, Graham, in the last year or so of dealing with a, a range of issues, what do you think the most problematic ones that you've said no, so I don't want to know about? I'd be interested to know what your reaction would, would be to that. What's the most problematic ones? Um... I honestly can't. I honestly can't remember. Um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just suggesting whether there were any technical things, or, or more whether it was certain sorts of editors or editing behaviours that you just find problematic that you would rather just let somebody else deal with. Yeah, I don't like dealing with complex communication, like things that require, require a lot of communication. Um, I just want something that's, that's more black and white, really. Yeah, but I've been very impressed by, by what you've been able to, um, to scan through on something and solve. And it makes me wonder more and more about what JAWS is actually doing for you to be able to, to get through fairly large, either talk page items or, or large articles. Is it what you were saying earlier on it's to do with headings? Sometimes, yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes it can be the heading. Sometimes I, I just know where to look for something. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Graham. Sort of experience. Thank you. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kitty. Hey, Graham. It's Meridad Porzaki from the Movement Communication Team at the Foundation. Uh, for those of you that may not know, Graham volunteered to um, participate in the Sound Logo Contest, and he actually screened close to 3,000 Sound Logo submissions, which is just incredible. Thank you. So I'm curious, Graham, what was it like? Um, were there sound vandalisms that you caught? You caught a few that were very obvious copies of well-known uh, sounds, like one of them I think was the ABC Australian News uh, opening, <laughs> opening chart. So what was that experience like? And I'm also curious to learn, um, how did you review sounds with a screen reader and what was that process like for you? Um, it, was, it was kind of, it was interesting, but it got more hectic as it went on. Um, <laughs> And yes, there, there was some vandalism, um, and someone took a lot of care to make, an, make a brief production of 
the Channel 10 news theme. Um, that, was, that was interesting. <laughs> and there was also some more creative vandalism as well. Um, with a screen reader, it was, it was pretty straightforward. Um, the only minor problem was when you hit the play button, you'd hear this, oh, something about this, this sound cannot be played. Um, but I just, I just ignored that. You, as a screen, when you use a screen reader, you're going to ignore a lot of, a lot of things. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, we've got another question. Thank you. Uh, hey, I'm Sadeep. Uh, I'm from India. I also work with, in the culture and heritage team at the foundation. I've been a Wikimedian as well uh, for a long time. And my question is about uh, navigating that subtle difference between a curious newbie and uh, a Wendell. How do you do that? A curious newbie and a what, sorry? And a Wendell. And a Wendell. A clear, clear cut Wendell. Yeah, right. Um, I have a joke with a good friend of mine that I'm a, that I'm a Wikipedia meanie. <laughs> Which is probably true. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm probably more harsh than some people, some other people would be. <laughs> um, it, it's all a matter of it's all a matter of intent, and you know, like, are people editing in good faith or not? And sometimes that can be hard to tell. Um, if you've got to just think like. Would I, as a newbie, do something like that for the good of the project, or are they really just messing around? And sometimes it's really obvious when they're messing around, but sometimes it's, it's not obvious what, what they're actually trying to do. Definitely. I would just like to add on to that. Um, my first edit on comments was a copyright violation. Oh, naughty, <laughs> naughty. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't know, and then someone came and told me. And today I have uh, like more than 200 quality images, more than 12 featured pictures and comments. So like I did need that first hand holding in a way. And I think that's something that's missing on our uh, projects and like could benefit a lot and bring in more people. Yeah, mentorship is hard on, on the wiki projects. Uh, uh, Mike Dickerson from New Zealand. Uh, following on from the alt text question, I was sitting here puzzling, and I'm sure other people are. It's my first time even encountering something like a screen reader. I hadn't even entered my consciousness, and now I'm wondering, what are some things that we as sighted editors do that make your life harder, or what could we do differently to make your life easier when we're editing? Um, some of the hardest things are relatively esoteric, um, like putting, putting blank lines with no content between list items. Um, if you write, say, star A, then press enter twice, and star B, then enter twice, and star C, instead of coming out as a list of three items, as you probably intended, it will come out as list of one item A, list of one item B, list of one item C, and that's really hard to read for a screen reader. Um, and also, please don't move the table of content around into weird places in the wiki markup, because we, we sort of expect the table of content to be in a certain place, and when it's moved around, that can be disruptive. Um, on the English Wikipedia, a lot of a few people have kindly made bots to fix a lot of those problems for me. And yeah, that's really cool. I, I want to just pick up, I think, what you were just saying there um, about, um, I mean, is there a place, Graham, that you see for either, you know, the classic kind of training or toolkits or FAQs to sort of address some of those kind of issues you're just talking about then? Is that something that you see value in Wikipedia has been thinking about? Um, there, is, I can, there is a very extensive accessibility guideline which has a lot of information about that. Yeah. And there's a more simplified page called Accessibility Do's and Don'ts where I had to, I had to go in and, and make, um, fix it, help fix the accessibility of that page. 
That's great. Well, look, Graham, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, a, a sort of a question just toward, you know, really a, a final thing to say, well, you know, is there anything you wanted to add? But also I just wondered, I mean, how do you see, um, you know, Wikipedia in, say, five or ten years? I mean, what's your vision for it? And also what would you like to be doing in that vision? Um, I honestly don't know. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Like, a lot of the things that I want for Wikipedia that aren't accessibility related are very esoteric. Um, I'd like to be able to... I'd like to be able to... be able to um, move edits around easily, more easily, um, like a revision move feature, but that's very hard. Um, <laughs> but for how it will be in the, few, in the next 10 years, honestly, who knows? With, the way technology is going and AI and stuff, just, yeah, it's impossible to know. Hopefully it'll be better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, it looks like we've got, we've got time for just one final question. Uh, so, so, I understand most of your editing is on uh, English Wikipedia. Have you tried other projects and what's your experience of accessibility on the other projects? Yes, I have tried, I have edited quite a lot of other projects um, for various reasons. I uploaded a lot of classical music to Wikimedia Commons and I also uploaded images of white canes to Commons. Um, I've never, the only accessibility problems I've ever had were related to the capture and trying to, trying to um, become auto-confirmed so you can bypass the capture. And I actually got blocked from the Chinese Wikipedia once. Because <laughs> they were like, what are you doing? You don't know any Chinese and you're trying to become auto-confirmed. And I had, to, I had to explain that I'm blind and I'm trying to fix some links on your project. And they, they did unblock me. <laughs> there you go. Well, look, this might be the point I think we, we need to close. So I just... I wanted to thank you, Graham. It's just been a real pleasure to meet you. And also, thank you so much for sharing uh, with us and talking a bit about, you know, your contributions to Wikipedia, how you see things, as well as some of these, you know, kind of accessibility issues and so on. My sense is that uh, your contributions have actually been deep, varied and consistent and that you've managed to sort of just get on with it. I think you've got seem to have that practical ability uh, and desire to really um, nurture what Wikipedia is. And I think that's obviously why you're held in great esteem uh, by the community and more widely. So thank you very much indeed for today. Thank you. Thank you.